thank you so much for being here. I am Dr. Shannon Bowen. For those of you that I haven't met yet, I'm a professor in the School of Journalism. I teach public relations, management, and ethics primarily. And I'm also the executive director and founder of the Global Strategic Communication Consortium, which is a nonprofit that's housed here in our CIC in the School of Journalism. And we're a consortium of Stratcom scholars from all over the world and mostly thought leaders in the field of strategic communication. We have an average of over 100 publications for every member of our group. And so they really are the global thought leaders of what's happening with our field. And we focus on ethics and futurism, which ethics has always been my topic, but I love futurism as well. And in our discipline, that space was completely unoccupied a few years ago. No one was talking about future studies and so on, other than a few of us. So that's why some of us got together and decided to form the GSCC. And I would like to thank the CIC and the School of Journalism for supporting us, offering sponsorships, helping to bring a guest to campus, allowing us to have an annual conference meeting that we call the Conclave, because it's really more of a brainstorming session than formal research presentations. Although they are research presentations, everybody in the room is an expert, and everyone has something unique to offer. So it's a great way for us to lead the field forward. And Dr. Avidar is also a member of that group. I'm going to let her do her own introduction because she has a few interesting slides for you, but I will just tell you a little about our background. We've known each other for one or two decades. I, I, I won't get specific because um, that might carbon date myself, but the first time, one of the first times I was talking about digital and algorithmic integrity was in about 2008 or 9 at the Bloodcom conference. And, the Bloodcom Symposium is arguably the most prestigious in public relations. And after my presentation, I was talking about social media, digital, and algorithmic integrity. And Dr. Avatar, Dr. Avatar came up and said, I, I'm really excited about this topic. I thought I was the only one kind of interested in this. And so since then, we've been <clears throat> some of the only researchers that were doing AI research for a long time. Then all of a sudden, everybody wants to do AI research. And so now we have a ton of colleagues who are interested and the field has just grown phenomenally. But luckily, we've had this great friendship over the years that has allowed us to follow one another's work um, and has really helped with the founding of a nonprofit group to study these types of issues. We have a book coming out about it from the GSCC called The Handbook of Innovations in Strategic Communication that is an Edward Elger publication. I think, with any luck, it'll probably be out in January or February, depending on how fast it moves through the typesetting and proof process. It's gonna be about 40 chapters from different experts, some of whom are in this room, but most of whom are all around the world in every continent except Antarctica. I am looking for an Antarctic member, but so far we haven't found that person yet. But I am happy that you're here. I'm gonna invite you to get up and get lunch. We have sandwiches, salads, bottles of water, move around, make yourself comfortable. I've warned Dr. Avidar that sometimes people come in and out because of our class schedules and she is happy to um, answer any questions, have discussions with us. So I am very happy that her university and the GSCC have made it possible for her to be here and the CIC providing lunch for us. So welcome Dr. Avidar. Appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me in the background without the mic? It's okay? Great. So I'm very glad to be here. Thank you, Professor Shannon Bowen, for inviting me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here and share with you my research about AI and its uh, influence on the field of public relations and mainly 
uh, consumption and production of uh, media content. Um, this is a joint project with Dr. Itzhak Mashiach uh, from the UM Oxford, um, and uh, he's, not with, uh, he's not here today, but we started this project, and the second part of this project actually won the Berger Research Award, and I want to thank the Global Strategic Communication Consortium headed by Professor Bowen, who uh, gave us this award to uh, deeply or more deeply explore ethical issues related to AI usage and uh, in the field of public relations. But let me start by introducing myself. Well, uh, I uh, graduated and, and undergraduated from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. I studied the political science and international relations. And afterwards, I started to work in uh, PR and uh, graduated in uh, communication and journalism studies. Um, I worked for s several years in PR and then conducted my PhD at the University of Haifa exploring interactivity and responsiveness between organizations and their publics. I was really interested in the interaction between organizations and publics, mainly online. How do they communicate? How they can be uh, make better communication between themselves? So as you can see here, um, I, this was in 2002 when I was a PR practitioner. I worked for non-profits, for-profits, governmental offices, and um, this was the time when the internet started to appear and be popular. And um, when I uh, worked as a PR practitioner, I always felt that I'm lacking something, and this something was a direct contact with my publics. I want to tell them something. I want to tell them that we have an innovation, but I can't approach them because I have to go through the gatekeepers. I have to uh, call the journalist and ask them to, to write something interesting about our organization. So when the internet arrived, I felt that this is a magic. I can suddenly uh, receive emails from publics that are interested in my services. It was like a revolution. And nowadays I, feel, nowadays I feel the same with AI. There is a revolution coming and it's already started and we still don't know exactly what are the, the um, outcomes of this revolution, but the, the feeling is the same as w when I was a PR practitioner and found out about the internet. So being an academic, as Shannon said, is very nice. We, have, we meet a lot of people around the world uh, Professor Bowen and myself met in various conferences. Um, these are some of my colleagues in the uh, um, Israel Valley College. I am the head of the marketing communication track, so this is my uh, expertise. And uh, I can show you here, uh, the Israel Valley College is situated in the northern part of Israel, next to Nazareth. Israel is very tiny. I don't know how many of you visited Israel, but Israel is 22,000 kilometers square, so it's like New Jersey. And uh, as you can see, we have uh, borders with the Mediterranean Sea, Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, and Egypt. And uh, our uh, uh, college is in the north, and I personally live, in even, live even further to the north, next to Naharia. So I live five miles from the Lebanese border. And as you know, we have now a very rough time since October 7. We are in a war in all places since the Hamas invaded the south. Here is the Gaza Strip. And the Hezbollah started immediately to shut the northern part of Israel. So we are in, are in a daily bombarding. And uh, most people that live at a zero to three kilometers or zero to three miles from the border, left their homes. They are refugees in Israel wandering about and uh, waiting to come back to their houses, but they can't because of the, these bombings. So uh, as you can see, this is the northern part right now. Everything is on fire, a daily bombing. All the red dots are places that were burned down and uh, Sometimes when I, f I sit in my garden, I see the missiles above, above my head. I sent you some pictures and this is really crazy. I mean, you can't live in a situation like this and we, we all hope that this situ situation will end. 
In addition, I have to mention uh, my friend's daughter, Romy, from our village, my neighbor, who was ki kidnapped from the Nova party. She's 24 and still in Gaza, somewhere in the tunnels. Nobody knows what happened to her and to other 108 people that are still missing, including babies, elderly women. Nobody knows what happened to them. Um, going, ba going back to my college, they're up in the north. So this is the communication building I teach here. Since we are in the northern part of Israel, most of our students are living in the periphery, in the nor northern periphery, and they are mostly the first generation of education. So their parents didn't go to academia. They are about at 23, 24 years old because many of them had to finish their military service first before coming to a study. And what is beautiful in our college, that this is a mixture of students of Jewish, Christians, Muslim, Druze, Cherkes. It's a variety of students living up in the north. We have really a diverse community with students, faculty, um, staff, all mixed and, and getting along very well. So this is a, an example of coexistence, of a real co coexistence. Uh, in my uh, faculty, in the communication, we have both professional studies and academic studies. So as I saw here, we have uh, an operating uh, TV station, radio station, um, uh, all kinds of professionals from the center of Israel come to teach the students how to work in TV, in radio, in social media marketing, SEO, um, application building for the smartphone, these are our students operating the stations, working, and beside of it, they have the full academic schedule and, and uh, syllabus, and I'm, the, I'm part of it because I teach the, some courses in, in marketing communication, and, and as I said, I'm the head of this track. Okay, so going from there into our study, uh, as I said, uh, Dr. Yitzhak Mashiach and myself, we are interested in AI, and we wanted to see how AI in fact um, uh, content production and consumption. As you probably know, Israel is a startup nation. We are very interested in innovations, in technology. So when AI arrived, everybody was interested, okay, let's see what does it do, how can we use it? And for us, Especially uh, AI and media was the most interesting thing. You probably also an, uh, experienced with ChatGPT, uh, DALI, Midjourney, Claude, and all these uh, types of platforms that uh, start to be very popular among people, and it transforms the landscape of content creation and consumption. Maybe some of you already saw um, commercials done by uh, AI and instead of models you have avatars like this is a Japanese commercial for green tea uh, it, it really has like a video of this uh, avatar talking instead of a model here is an Israeli commercial for BMW where this actress uh, um, Zorer, Ayelet Zorer, is talking with her young image when she was in her 20s. So, so she takes her young image in, in the car and they talk with each other because this was done by deep fake. Uh, so this has also started to be uh, popular. And uh, so in our study, we, we wanted to see how AI changes the media workplace, how it impacts the day-to-day -day activities of these media professionals and uh, how it can free them up for the more creative parts of their jobs and do all the regular mundan, mundan tasks, assist in generating uh, you know, all the ideas, optimize content strategies. So this is really an assistant. AI became an assistant for these uh, professionals. This is an example for a commercial uh, done uh, a few months ago, we visited uh, an advertising agency, and the advertising professional said, 
Listen, we got a, a call from Honda. They wanted to do a commercial for their white knight. They have a white knight with all the motorcycles. And in the past, it took me almost a week to do a commercial with all my stuff when you had to think and what, what are the ideas. And this took me 24 hours. I talked with the AI and he had suggestions, I had suggestions. We worked together in 24 hours. I had this commercial and Honda liked it very much. So it changes the way media is, is produced, the way uh, practitioners work. In, th in that case, case uh, advertising. So who is affected by this change? We can say everybody. The media practitioners, the PR professionals, the journalists, the content creators, the public itself, and the institutions, the PR and advertising agencies, the news organizations, all are influenced by this change of uh, AI-generated content. Here you can, you can see all these uh, affected parts. One important thing when talking about consuming and producing media is trust. Trust is very important because if you want people to read and consume your, uh, the things you write, they need to trust it and trust you and, and know that this is uh, something that uh, is reliable. So trust is defined as a long process wherein one party, the truster, willingly exposes themselves to vulnerability towards another party, the trustee. There are various research, and as you probably know, about trust in various fields like communication, like philosophy, uh, technology. Uh, all, all, everybody is talking about trust, which became a very important aspect in our lives when we really don't know what, what is true and what is false. Um, when we talk about trust and AI, so we uh, think that the level and frequency of technology adoption depends, among other, among other things, on the trust that you ha have towards uh, the uh, content uh, providers uh, and the content itself. So trust is really essential if we want to see how many people and in what way do they uh, trust the consumpti consumpted uh, content. So what we did in our study was to examine perceptions, actual usage, and knowledge regarding AI software and AI-created content among content producers and consumers. So we approached two groups. One was content consumers. It was a survey among 500 people. And one was uh, among content producers, 195 content producers. I will explain uh, uh, shortly. And we made a distinction between marketing communication and journalism, both among the producers and the content itself, because as you see, there is a difference between the two. Here is the, graphical, uh, the graphics of our study. Okay, what did we find about media professionals? So in our, in our survey, survey, we had media professionals from all kinds of fields, from advertising, content creation like blogs, social media, journalism, public relation, and in total it's 195 professionals from all kinds of media uh, fields. Most of them had experience of four to 10 years in the industry, but we had others, others as well. We asked them, what is your level of knowledge regarding AI technology? And most of them said, familiar at a good level. Okay, so they are already familiar at a good level. They are not experts, but they are familiar at a good level in AI technology. And when we asked them, how often do you use one of the AI platforms? So they say that every day, or at least once a day. So this shows us that the tool, this tool of AI is already there. Uh, professionals are using it. They are starting to become more and more experts in using these tools, 
and it's there. So if we think about the theory of diffusion of innovations of Rogers, so we can say that 43% it's the uh, early majority, okay? So it's really there and it's going to be more and more um, used, more and more uh, a part of the industry, of the media industry. Which of the following activities have you performed in the last months? So as you see, they performed various activities. Most of them consulted with AI technologies, asking questions. So it's like an, an assistant. They ask them questions. It's the same as the advertising, ad advertising guy told me that he was talking with his AI and they decided how the advertisement will look like. So here, uh, they ask, mainly ask questions, but, but also create textual content, create visual content. It's, it's becoming a, a diverse tool that can help in, in various ways. Another important thing that we found was that AI is blurring the boundaries. Um, these practitioners said and agreed the AI, uh, that AI is blurring the boundaries between content producers like PR agencies and professionals and journalism. So the content is not very clear if it's journalism, if it's social media, if it's uh, PR. Uh, and they also agree that uh, uh, AI is uh, blurring the boundaries between various types of content, marketing and journalistic content. This relates if we think about Jenkins, Jenkins and the convergence, convergence theory so maybe AI is changing the game now. Maybe the boundaries are blurring and there is something new is that comes up from this uh, revolution. Uh, one important thing, I think that Sharon, uh, Sharon will like, is the ethics and regulation. The professionals said that there is a, a consensus that regulation is needed in the field of AI with concerns about privacy and information security. It is believed that information from AI should be verified through other means and sources, highlighting the issue of trust, and emphasis should be placed on ethics, transparency, and information security. When it comes from content creators, professionals, this is very important and very interesting because they produce this content and they feel that there should be some kind of regulation, there should be some t uh, thinking about ethics, about transparency, and this will be the focus of, of our next study that won the Berger Award. So we want to focus on these, these issues. As for the publics, okay, we asked 500 people uh, almost the same questions. So they are less familiar with AI, okay? Uh, regular people, people uh, are still not familiar with AI, although they have encountered content created by AI. Here you can see the percentages. What is your level of knowledge regarding the AI technology? And most of them said, I, I know the technology at a basic level, or I don't know the technology at all. So regular people, of course, they know the AI less. Um, they use it less, um, but choose the one that best suits your recent personal experience. I have been exposed to content written, produced, or created by AI. So most of them saw this content, encountered it, recognized that what they see is an AI-generated uh, visual or text. Here we, we compared professionals with publics and asked them in my opinion, every content creator should pay attention to the following topics, and we gave them all kinds of topics, as fact-checking, ethical code, transparency, security, and you can see that uh, the public is more aware and more concerned, have more concerns about these issues that, than the professionals, but both of them think that it is uh, an important to pay attention to um, fact-checking, ethical code, and transparency. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll come back to this, the difference between the publics and professionals, why there is a difference in the percentages here. Reli reliability and credibility. Here again, when we ask the public about ethics, so there is a high priority 
to re reliability, accuracy, ethics, and transparency. The public sees a distinction between AI-created advertising and marketing content and journalistic news content. This issue is in interesting because the public accepts more um, content which is advertising or marketing created by AI. Why? We can guess that, that people that see an advertisement, they, they know this is an advertisement, I should be skeptic, there is somebody behind it, there is somebody with an interest behind it, but when they see a news release or a, a news item, they want to be more sure that the one that wrote it, he, he doesn't have a, I'm, everybody has an interest, but it's not so in your face. They want to be sure that it's more reliable. So they make a distinction between advertising and marketing content and uh, journalistic news content. Generally, the public attributes low credibility to AI-created content. And we will see it even further that if you don't know the tool, if you don't use it, you are more skeptic, you are more afraid, because you don't know to what expect. What are these results that I get? Who, who wrote these ex uh, results? If sometimes people think that what they get from, let's say, ChatGPT is a uh, cut and paste from some document, but it's not. It, it doesn't work like this. And they don't know who wrote this text that I, I'm reading now. Okay? They don't know the tool, so they are more afraid, more skeptic about it. To what extent do you think the following media content is reliable? A commercial advertisement. So it's moderate. They think it's okay. It's moderate, a co a commercial, it's okay. Here are some examples of commercials that, there are all that already use avatars and instead of uh, um, humans. A propaganda message created and or edited by an AI tool for national information purposes. It's also got a mo moderate score, um, a moderate score, but I'm really uh, interested about this question because during uh, the war now, we have a lot of AI generated content like this, the, the ki uh, kids in the tunnels. So we as a public know that this was generated by an AI. You can see this is not a picture and you know that you can take, you can take a photo of them there because you don't know where are they. So I'm, I'm really interested in this question whether if you use AI for pro propaganda, it, it, is, it, uh, is it useful? Does it make you um, um, catch the message more than if it was something more realistic? I mean, not the tunnels, but something else that you can show so this, I, this I think, is an interesting question because more and more um, propaganda messages will be created by AI. And I don't know if this is useful or is it just a waste of time. We asked them about uh, how reliable is a politician speech and they said to a small extent. Now I don't know if it's because of the politicians that are <laughs> not reliable or maybe the content itself, they don't want to see a politician speech written by AI. A journalistic news, here again, it's moderate or to a small extent. So they don't feel uh, that it's m reliable or um, they don't like it when the AI is writing a journalistic content, content mainly news. A, a post on social media is okay, no problem, it's moderate. Uh, when I see an image created by AI or social media, for example, on Facebook, I feel that I'm being deceived. No, moderate, okay? So when they see a post on social media, they are okay with it. They, are, they, they don't feel a, a big problem with it. When I... I'm told that certain content is created by AI, I feel a lack of trust towards the correctness and reliability of the content. It's moderate and here it's important to see that when I'm told, so when they know this was created by AI, they are okay with the content, okay? It's, it's, they, they feel that it's, it's okay, it's, it's reliable. If there is an agreed marking of any content, text or image created by AI, I will feel more confident in the reliability of the information and this got strongly agree and agree. So people would like to see uh, some kind of mark 
or sign. This was created by AI, and then they feel more confident. It's like when you see a commercial, you want to, sh to see that this is a commercial. I'm not in a, it's not a part of the news now, okay? This is a commercial. So here again, if there would be a mark, this is, this is done by AI, the, f the public feels much safer, much better with this uh, type of content. Do we trust content creators who use AI? We asked them a few question, uh, questions about it. So a content creator that uses AI is for the most part trustworthy. Okay, moderate, they accept it, that uh, content creators can use AI and, and use AI. The use of AI in the field of communication reduces the trust I acquire in the media institutions in general. It's also moderate, okay? I think part of the thing is that people that don't know the tool, they didn't uh, experience with it, they, they don't have really, uh, you know, uh, black and white uh, thoughts. They think uh, it's, it's okay, moderate, it's okay, I don't, agree and I don't disagree, I think it's okay. And this is part of it because they don't really know it. Uh, they don't really use it. They just started to use it. And, and again, I'm talking about the public, not the professionals. So when we compare the two, we look at the media professionals, they have a high familiarity in usage of this uh, AI. They use it, this is an assistant that helps them in their regular work. Uh, they have a better understanding of, uh, of the ca capabilities of these tools because they use it. They have experience. They know the limits of the, the tool, so they are okay with it. They, they accept it as their new assistant. Um, they view a, a AI as a valuable tool that enhances their work efficiency and their creativity. They appreciate how a AI can automate mundane tasks and free them up for the more creative parts of their work. This practical benefit fosters a higher degree of trust in AI's ability to produce reliable and useful content. So they have more trust in the content produced by AI, again, because they know it, and they know the limits, and they know what they can produce, and maybe they can recognize content that was uh, uh, produced by AI. Uh, they also have a critical understanding. Uh, despite their uh, use of this AI, they have critical understanding um, and critical perspective on the quality and ethical implication <coughs> of AI-generated content. They are aware of the potential for error, biases, and ethical issues. As we saw before, they are aware of these issues, and therefore they are cautious, but not distrustful of the technology. As for the consumers, <coughs> we saw that they have a lower familiarity and understanding, and, and therefore, since they have less direct experience, they are more skeptic, have lower levels of trust in AI-generated content. They perceive as AI as a box, a black box. They don't really know what, what is happening inside. They don't know how, how the results are coming out of this box, and therefore they, they are less uh, trustful towards this box, and they might feel uneasy about the idea that content they consume is generated by algorithms rather the, than human beings, okay? They, are, they, they feel less comfortable ab about this. The public often associates higher credibility with human-created content, especially in the areas like journalism and news reporting, and AI-generated content is sometimes perceived as less reliable and trustworthy, particularly if it, if it is not clearly labeled as such. I think that this is a, time, uh, a ma matter of time, because this is very new. If you ask them the same questions in 10 years, I think th the answers will be uh, others. For example, if you ask now people uh, if they are willing to drive with an autonomous car, 
or uh, whether they prefer to go with a driver, an expert driver, I think most of us will say expert driver because we know what to expect. So I can look at this driver and see if it's, he's reliable. But an autonomous car, I will sit there and the car will drive me. Wow, it's really frightening. Although, when we think about it logically, the autonomous car didn't drink before, it didn't sleep, and don't have to sleep. It doesn't detect messages during driving. So logically, I, I would say, okay, autonomous car, of course. And this will happen, I think, in my opinion, in, in several years. So the trust towards AI uh, can increase. Uh, there are problems with it that I will uh, discuss a little bit, but um, this is a new tool. And if you remember when the smartfo uh, smartphones appeared, everybody was annoyed. Oh, what will happen now with a smartphone? And everybody is going in the street with, with this computer, and people won't interact anymore. And uh, when the internet arrived, we had all the same fears. Oh, great, Te good uh, new technology. What will happen now with the internet? So we are in this phase that this is very new, and therefore we don't have answers. Okay. Um, when we compare the consumers and producers, we can see that familiarity and expertise is made mainly in the hands of media professionals <coughs> that already know these tools. The public limited familiarity with AI leads to a wider range of uh, opinions from cautious acceptance to complete distrust. Uh, and both of them are afraid of ethical and they have ethical concerns. Uh, although the public may rely more on external assurances like regulation and transparency labeling, they need more assurances that this is a, a okay, this, this content is okay. The experts need more um, um, training, more understanding of the tools themselves, which they already started to have. Companies started to have like seminars to know AI better, how to use it, what are the limitations of it. Uh, trust building measures. Okay, so for media professionals, it's a continued education, hands-on experience. For the public, it's more increasing transparency, education about AI process, clear labeling, as we saw, of AI-generated content. Now, here are thoughts about the future. This is something that I'm thinking of a lot of time, and I don't, have, no, I don't know I have the answers. I'm just sharing it with you. As we saw, the public wants um, some regulation and labeling the content that was made by AI. And let's say that Western democratic countries will do it because this is fair, okay, to label uh, AI-generated content, uh, visuals, text. But what if a part of the world will do it, and a part of the world will take advantage that they can share a lot of um, untruthful material to make the, you know, this, this chaos even bigger, to have a lot of uh, uh, deep fake images of politicians saying all kinds of stuff, uh, um, increasing the hatred between people. This is a very strong tool that can be used for positive or negative purposes. And I'm really afraid that we, as a Western world, a democratic world, we think about how we can regulate, how we can make it uh, ethical. But there are parts in the world that don't want to make it ethical. Opposite of it, they can use it as a weapon. This is a great weapon to, uh, to make uh, confusion and make chaos in the world. And then we can't uh, distinguish between truth and false. I can't know, I don't know if I see a video, is this true? Is it, this politician said so? And I don't know, this was a deep fake video. I, today, the technology is, is in its beginning, but the AI is, is getting better and better, and the ability to make images and text that you won't recognize that this was done by AI is enormous. So this is something for the future to think of. How can we deal with such a confusion, with such a, a lot of uh, um, um, fake news, if you can call it, fake reality? And also another question is whether uh, there is a new role for content creators. If um, AI can generate advertisement, can write text messages, 
Uh, and uh, right now, the professionals use it as an assistant. Maybe in a few years, we don't need these professionals because the AI can generate it without them. We simply uh, can employ AI machines, don't pay them salaries, and they will do the work. And so what will happen with this field of communication? What will happen with the professionals? Where, where is their part in this, this industry? So these are, uh, these are questions that I, th that I think of. And here are a few questions as, a research, as researchers that you can uh, look at and think about. For example, how and to what extent will AI change existing theoretical concepts in, in PR, but also in advertising, in journalism? For example, uh, example strategic planning, management, and management, reputation building, organization, public relationship, dialogue. The AI will change this concept. So how will it change these concepts? How will AI affect the field of crisis management? Uh, can AI be used to predict potential crises by analyzing trends, public sentiment, and emerging issues on social media? If this is a, such a good assistant, it can help uh, maybe prevent crises. Organizations can consult AI on how to uh, predict crises and how to manage them. Will AI lead to the development of a new model for organization public relationship building? Um, what kind of relationship do I, as a public, have with AI? It's not a person, it's not an organization. What kind of relationship do we have? How and to what extent will the concept of transparency and accountability change in the age of AI? How effective is AI written content compared to human written content in the field of media relations? Maybe AI knows better than the human how to write uh, good media, uh, 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 media relations uh, content. How can bias in AI algorithms affect PR campaigns? For example, reinforcing stereotypes or marginalizing certain groups. And what AI-driven metrics can be developed to more accurately measure the effectiveness of PR campaigns? So all of these questions are questions that we as researchers can try to address. As I said, this is uh, really the, the beginning of this revolution. So um, these questions are open and, and everybody now tries to uh, explore AI. Uh, as, as I said, uh, Professor Bowen, in our classes now, everything should be AI. So everybody's changing their syllabi to put AI inside, to refer to AI. So this is really a revolution going on. And as a communication researchers, I think that we have to focus a, on the, on the um, outcomes of this uh, revolution. Um, thank you, and I will be glad to hear your questions and, and, and answer them. By the way, if you see these images were created by AI, and it's still, the, the faces, for example, are still not in focus. They still, if you ha see a lot of pictures with AI that are AI, AI generated, the people have six fingers, okay? Uh, we can still see that pictures were made by AI. In the future, it won't be so <laughs> clear. <laughs> <laughs> 